Hey, what's going on everybody? It's Mike from Dungeons and Diving. Today we're going to do a very quick tutorial on how to get up and running with Ida to do some reverse engineering. If you don't have the pro version, no worries, they do have a free version of it. On the top left corner of my screen, you can see that I have HelloWorld.c. It is a standard Hello World program. All it does is it prints Hello World to the screen and returns. Um, in order to reverse engineer this, you need a software like Ida like we're going to use. So the first step is to go to hexrays.com and download Ida. If you want the Ida free version of it, it's hexrays.com forward slash Ida free. Um, go ahead and click the download button. Download for Windows, Linux, Mac, um, or even if you have the Apple Silicon version of it, they have the Mac uh, ARM version of it. Um, I've already got this installed. I'm not going to waste your time with that. So the next step is uh, to actually open up Ida. All right, so you can see if you don't have it before, um, you're not going to have anything in this box. I've already opened up the Hello World program in here. So you would click New, and then you're going to go and figure out what you're going to do. Um, I have a few other applications in here um, that are going to be coming for future videos that are a little more in-depth than Hello World. Um, but, but for now, I'm just going to go back to the main screen here, and I'm going to use the Hello World app. Okay, um, it was compiled on a Linux machine, 64-bit. Um, so you can just stick with the standard default settings here. Um, and it was relatively quick on my machine. Uh, sh this program should not be difficult for anyone uh, to run on their machine either because it's super simple. All right, so the first thing that you're going to notice is you're going to see you got a bunch of different functions up here. You have a graph. I'm not going to get into a in-depth assembly tutorial here. Uh, I'm going to assume that you know a little bit and enough to get around, I will go over what's in this main function here. Um, on the on the right hand side of the screen, uh, you can see the Ida view, and it creates what are called basic blocks. Um, if you have more functions or jumps, uh, you'll actually start seeing them building a graph out based on if you have a less than or greater than or any other type of branching statement. You'll have red and green lines coming off based on the various conditions it can be. Uh, but since I set this up to only have the main function, we don't have that. Uh, if I hit, the, if I click inside of here so that I'm interacting with this instead of one of the other frames, uh, and I hit the space bar, you can see that it jumps to a different view. Um, it's just, it's the same thing, just a different view. Uh, you can actually see lots more of the code, lots more of the different uh, data that's embedded into it. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and work on this graph view here because it's really all that we need for this tutorial. All right, so when you have a, a C program, most developers think that the C program begins with the main function. And while that is accurate from a programmer's perspective, the compiler actually creates what's called a start function. The purpose of the start function is that it will go from a blank slate, load whatever re uh, requirements, such as the, the C standard library, and then call your main function. Um, for this tutorial, we're not going to dig too deep into here, but there is some fun stuff you can do there if you wanted to um, actually do some monkey business like uh, creating some functionality that will only run if a debugger is or is not present in a way to hide malicious code. Uh, but again, for this tutorial, that's that's out of scope here. So you can see uh, the entry point is this underscore start. It goes into here, and then you'll see libc um, kicks off here. That way you have your supporting libraries. And then you can see start also calls our main function. Um, once the main function returns, It'll return to start, and then it'll return back to the operating system. So once I've double-clicked on main, um, I'm back into the, into the normal graph view. Um, I'm just going to zoom in here so you can see it a little bit better. Um, you'll notice that there's a couple instructions here at the top. These two, this, this push, RBP, move, RBP, RSP, uh, that is uh, the prologue. Prior to functions actually executing their own stuff, they have to push uh, the base pointer onto the stack so that way when you return you can recover from it. Additionally, it will move the, the stack pointer which points to the top of the stack. Um, that address is going to be uh, moved to the uh, base pointer as well. So now both of them will point to the top of the stack. And the reason for that is if you have local variables, it, it creates what's called a stack frame. You're going to see this prolog pretty much for every single function that your program is going to call. Past the prolog, um, you're going to see this LEA, it's load effective address. Uh, it loads, loads S into racks. 
you may be like, hey, what does S stand for? Um, S is not an arbitrary thing. Basically, it is a, a label or symbol that is uh, compiled into this program, and it actually does point to something. You can see that it says Hello World here. Ida was smart enough to understand that S points to that, and it's pointing to a string. If you double click on S, it'll take you to the data section up here. And this address of a whole bunch of zeros, 2004, um, is also labeled as S. And it's exactly what it correlates to is hello world. All right, and if you see me skip backwards, I'm hitting the escape key, but you can use the, the back and forward buttons on the top left corner. All right, so we're basically saying what this statement does, it says the address of S, which is 2004 in hex, load 2004 into RAX, our, our uh, AX register. Then the next thing it's gonna do is it's gonna move the address that's stored in, in RAX and store it into RDI. So now RDI and RAX are gonna both be hex 2004. And the reason for that is with older 32-bit assembly, um, we should expect parameters to be pushed onto the stack. Remember that I said that this program was compiled in 64 bits. With 64 bits, um, they also increase the number of registers that our Intel-based CPUs have. So it's faster for us to be able to push to the register than to push onto the stack, which is out in memory. So RDI is the location of the first argument. And in this case, um, RDI is going to point to hello world. And that argument is provided to the put statement, which will print it to the screen. So when, when puts is called, RDI, whatever lives at that address, which in our case is hello world, will print to the screen. After that, um, we need to understand the difference between volatile and non-volatile registers. Uh, so certain registers like EAX are volatile. We don't know what's gonna be in them afterwards. And in this case, EAX will always contain the return value of puts. Uh, so one of the things that this compiler did is I pushed a zero into EAX because the fact that I am returning zero, if you recall, I return zero here and whatever was in it with this, with the return statement from puts, I don't care about that. What I want to do is this, I need to make sure I return zero. So I'm populating EAX with a zero because I'm going to be returning and that value needs to live in EAX. At this state right here, you're gonna see this pop RBP and wondering what am I doing? Well, if you remember the very beginning in our prologue, I had to push RBP because that's the base pointer from, the, from whatever happened prior to the function I'm in. Now I need to populate that so that RBP knows where it needs to point again once our function returns. Um, you'll notice that there's nothing that uh, deals with this move RBP RSP statement and that's probably because of compiler optimization. I never declared any local variables. Normally what you would see is you would see some sort of stack alignment down here uh, right above this pop statement. And that is called your epilogue. Uh, so you're gonna have either a statement that looks like this push RBP, move RBP RSP, followed by a uh, pop RBP and then a stack adjustment for RSP. Or you may see enter and leave. And those just translate to the same exact things. Okay, so with that said, we have walked through how to load a program into IDA. We've walked through this very simple, uh, this main function here that'll print hello world. And we've also looked at how to find what these addresses are. When we have a load effective address, what does this translate to? And in this case, it just was a pointer to where hello world was stored in our program. Okay, with that, we're gonna wrap this video up and stay tuned for a somewhat similar uh, version of this tutorial utilizing the tool known as Ghidra. Thanks for watching and happy hacking.